What is up, everybody? Mondays are normally with the coach, but the coach had a family emergency. So keep him in your thoughts and prayers. So that means I'm going solo tonight. Now, tonight's show probably won't be super long, but I think I got a good 30 minutes. And really, there's a couple of things that I want to discuss tonight. Number one, I want to talk a little bit about the draft. I want to talk about some of the players that you keep hearing that 49ers fans are clamoring for. I want to talk about the slip of a particular player that I think would be awesome if the 49ers could get him. I also want to talk about the reality, the salary cap hell that the 49ers are in next year that a lot of people are overlooking. And then I want to talk about Brandon Ayuk, which is the main title. It is the thumbnail. A couple things there, a couple rumors, a couple thoughts. And we're going to talk about those things plus more next. Welcome back to Last Second Sports. We are giving you our take down to the last second. And as I said, normally tonight would be with Coach, but Coach is not able to make it. That means I am flying solo. But you know what's nice about flying solo? It's the fact that if there are questions that y'all have, we can have more of a one-on-one -on -one conversation throughout the course of the show. So if there's any questions that pop up, any thoughts, Anything that you're wondering, you can always throw that in the chat. What's up, JD Durham? I don't, you've got a lot to say through emojis. Pretty funny. Pretty funny. What's up, Niner Gang? All right, y'all. I've got three main topics that I want to get through. As I am talking, though, I will be paying attention to the chat as much as possible, answering any questions that you may have. Really, I think topic number two, even though I didn't title it, that for the show to me that's the meat and potatoes of the show talking about what i deem as salary cap hell for the 49ers 2025 major major issues that nobody wants to talk about nobody is bringing up and we've got to take a look at those because it is going to be rough next year trying to figure out how to field the team stay competitive there's a lot that is there to unpack. So we're going to talk about that. But before we get there, we want to talk about this year's draft. Now, obviously, we want to know what's going to happen at 31. And we don't know for sure. There's a lot of rumors. There's a lot of thoughts. I know that we want to go offensive line, but really the way that things may fall, the left tackle position, there's only so many left tackles that are worth a first round pick. So the question becomes, let's say they get to the sixth best left tackle or the fifth best left tackle in the draft at 31, but you've got the best safety in the draft, arguably sitting there in Newbin. Do you go with that? What if you have a top three corner sitting there or a top four wide receiver? What do the 49ers do in that scenario. And really, one of the guys that all of a sudden there are rumors that he's falling in the draft for whatever reason. I mean, I think it might be because he's a position that there's value in this position, but not like there is with a left tackle or an edge rusher or even a corner quarterback wide receiver. And that's the center position. And you've got Jackson Powers Johnson sitting there, who is clearly far and away the best center in this draft. Shout out to the Oregon Ducks, by the way. And now they're saying that he might fall to the late first round, early second round. Now, I don't know how true that is, but it's interesting because if you've been doing mock drafts, if you've done them over the last few days since those rumors have started, he's been falling to the San Francisco 49ers in the PFF mock draft almost every single time. If not, he's getting picked at like pick 28 or something like that. 
So if he is there, should the 49ers go and get him? That's the question. Would you be happy with them getting a center in the draft over, let's say, the fifth or sixth best left tackle? I know left tackle is, or tackle, period, is a bigger position of need on the surface, but Kyle Shanahan once said that the center position was the lifeline of the offense, and then he started Brendel, but that's what he said. He thinks it's that important. Remember, the center position calls out the uh, protections, not Brock Purdy, so we know it's an important position. Would you be happy with the best center in the draft falling to 31 would you be good with that that's the question because to me he's the clear best center and if the rumors are true and he falls that far i mean i don't know how you pass on that i'd rather have him over the fifth best receiver fifth best left tackle third or fourth best corner the second Best safety, depending on how you view Newbin. I view him as the number one guy, but some people say that he's number two behind DeGene. And I'm not talking about Frazier. I'm not talking about Frazier. I'm talking about Jackson Powers Johnson. Oregon Duck Center. He's the guy. He's the number one guy. So would you be happy if he fell? Now, here's another thing that keeps coming up with these mock drafts. 49er fans tend to fall in love with some big name players that have bloodlines with the San Francisco 49ers. We've heard Owen's son being out there. We've heard Rice's son being a possibility. We've heard Frank Gore Jr. being a possibility. And we've heard Luke McCaffrey, brother of Christian McCaffrey, being a possibility. I got to be honest, looking at all of them, reading about all of them, I think only one of these guys actually makes sense to me, to me. And that's Luke McCaffrey. Just athlete for athlete, he actually fits the bill of what you would be looking for. They're saying now he might be a second round pick when before it was third round is probably where they were looking to get him. Now, I don't know for sure where he's going to go, but late second round, middle, early third, potentially. But when you look at Luke McCaffrey, started out as a quarterback, transferred to Rice and is now a wide receiver, six foot two. But here's something interesting about him. I don't know if you guys have delved into the RAS or relative athletic score, where they basically take height and weight of a player. They take their vertical leap, their broad jump, their three cone drill. They they basically take four categories, the agility, the height, weight, your jumping ability, and then your straight line speed. And they throw it into an athletic score. Luke McCaffrey at six foot two put out a RAS score of 9.56 out of 10 which on the surface already sounds really good. Do you realize that ranks 137th out of 3,090 receivers who were eligible for the draft since 1987? That puts him in the top 4% athletically of all the receivers since 1987. That's crazy. That is absolutely crazy. Now, that doesn't mean that he's going to be a baller, but when you look at things, it's a great start, especially a wide receiver. You've got somebody who his brother is already a high-level player with the 49ers. Imagine if the 49ers draft him. You know he's going to know this offense very quickly because of his brother. And... He's got a RAS score of 956, which ranks 137th out of 3,090 receivers since 1987. That's insane. So when I look at it and say, okay, sure, there's McCaffrey, there's Rice, 
There's Owen's son. There's Frank Gore Jr. Really, to me, there's one guy <laughs> that I would like to have out of all of them, and that's McCaffrey. That's McCaffrey. I think out of all of them, he has the biggest chance to be something. Now, you're going to have to risk more. You're probably going to have to draft him higher than some of those other guys. But I don't want to have all the ex 49ers kids on this team. I do want McCaffrey's brother, if the price is right, maybe you can get him in round three, trade up, middle of round three. I don't know if I would do it with my second round pick, but damn, he is extremely good athlete. I mean, he's an extremely good athlete. He's elite. He's the elite of the elite when it comes to athleticism at the wide receiver spot. It's crazy. Absolutely crazy. If we did what? If we took all of the sons, every 49er son ever? Yeah, I don't know, man. Dazza says, why stand Pat at 31? We only have one, maybe two years with this current roster. Trade up and get a stud tackle or guard. What does it take, though? I mean, when you talk about moving up in the first round, how far are you trying to move up, Dazza? That's the question. And what picks would you have to give up to move up? You presumably don't want to get rid of any second or third round picks. So if you want to move up seven, eight spots, I don't know that throwing some fourths and fifth rounders at it is, is enough. You're probably going to need to include a third round pick. Are you willing to do that? I don't know. I mean, there's going to be good players there at 31. There's going to be good players at 31. That is not the question. The question becomes, no matter where the 49ers pick, really where any team picks, are you going to get one of those players? Because it's your choice who you draft. Just because you have a spot doesn't mean you're going to get a good player. There's going to be good players available at 31. Do the 49ers draft the right player who's good for a long time? That is the question. That question still remains if they move up to 24. I know when we look at it from the outside and we say, okay, we think this guard or this tackle is elite. So go get him. Yeah, but that guy might be a bust. We don't know. We have no idea. So I don't know if I'm willing to give up, let's say, a third round pick to move up six or seven spots to get a guy that we think is going to be good. What if he doesn't pan out and then you've lost out on that third round pick and maybe that third round pick could have been potentially somebody good as well. That's what makes this really tough. The 49ers are in a situation where I don't know necessarily that they're going to make, what is it, 11 picks, all 11 picks. But if they're going to move up, I would see them moving up maybe like round three-ish to go get a guy that they really like. I don't know if round one is the move because you're going to get rid of some depth at good picks in order to do that. So Big Money says first and a fourth this year and a second next year is what I'd offer to move up. But that's, I mean, that's might be what it takes, but that's kind of steep if you think about it. Wait till I go over the salary cap thing and then you tell me if that's something you would be willing to do because next I'm going to go over the salary cap and looking at 2025 and how disastrous this thing is looking on the surface, I don't know that you want to give up that much capital when they really need to build through the draft over these next two years. There's a lot of issues with the salary cap going forward. So, and I agree. I, third string, I do agree. There's no chance that 11 rookies make the team. I get that. But that's why, in my opinion, you move up in round like three, round four, and package a lot of those late round picks to go make something happen. That's what I would do. But, Uh, let's see. Here we go. Smack Jones says first round draft Sanders from Texas, unless Bowers is around. I don't think Bowers is making it draft up in the second to steal a top eight offensive tackle. In my opinion, Guyton, Morgan, uh, Sumataya circle back and draft Roman Wilson, then get to work on the DBs. I wouldn't be mad at that. I wouldn't be mad at that draft. Hmm. Interesting. 
that see that's that's kind of where my thought is like let's say jpj falls to the 49ers at 31 go get the best center in the draft helps your offensive line then i think there are going to be tackles there in round two maybe you'd have to trade up a little bit to go get a guy in round two but it's easier to trade up less capital than it would be in round one and there's going to be tackles there if you really want to tackle i think some of those tackles in round two are, are going to be pretty good so i like what smack jones is saying here i do what's up ryan's in the house what's up ryan Niner Gang says, Jesse, what will be the bestest position to fall after this coming season? Uh, I don't know <laughs> exactly what you're asking there. Maybe rephrase the question. I'm stupid also, so I'll, I'll give you that. But this <laughs> you're the one that commented this, didn't you? That was so funny. I screenshot it. I screenshot it and sent it to Larry because I thought it was so funny. You did a great job. Oh, he said biggest. Jesse, what will be the biggest position to fall after this coming season? Are you talking about on the 49ers team? Oh, we're going to go over it. It's a disaster. Guys, it is a disaster. And again, nobody is giving this enough conversation right now. And I get it. We're looking at the 2024 season, but next year, Dude, it's it's bad. In fact, let's just let's talk about it. You tell me if it's as bad as what I'm making out it out to be. I think it's not good at all. Let's go over it. Okay. So the 49ers cap situation right now, six point seven million dollars roughly. Now, based off of the draft picks they have, you're looking at about ten million dollars for this incoming rookie class. But not to worry, the 49ers are going to free up around $20 million here in the next few months. One, signing Brandon Ayuk, presumably, will free up about $10 million by extending him. And then you're going to get some money for the Eric Armstead situation. I believe that's going to free up around $15-ish million. So that's going to put the 49ers at around $31 million. However, 10 of that is roughly going to go to rookies. So about $21 million. Now, the 49ers usually will make a trade midseason or they'll sign somebody late in training camp if they see fit. Maybe they have an injury. So I imagine the 49ers will carry over something like, I don't know, let's go with $15 million into next year. Okay? $15 million into next year, which is great because they're going to need it. Here's the 49ers salary cap situation going into next year, okay? They have 39 unrestricted free agents 2025. Next year, 39 unrestricted free agents. Now I'm going to go over some of the bigger names here in a minute, but even though they have 39 unrestricted free agents, they're projected to be $30 million over the salary cap. Now, this is not an exact science. This year, the salary cap is $255 million. The projection next year is $273. Some people are saying it could get as high as $280. But let's just go off. Let's, let's go best case scenario. Let's say it goes up $30 million like it did this year which is not likely to happen in back-to-back -back years. But let's go best-case scenario. So goes up $30 million, All right, that puts them at 285 So instead of being $30 million over the cap, they're $16 million over the cap. Now, they carry over the $15 million from this year. They only need to clear about a million. Sounds good on the surface, right? Well, no. It's not as good as what it sounds because... There's two problems with this. Number one, and this isn't even including the 39 unrestricted free agents, so who are they going to bring back? But number one, this is not including the salary of Brandon Ayuk, which presumably next year would be, I don't know, let's say, let's say they make it inexpensive in year one. Let's say it's 20 million instead of 25 or whatever it is that he's going to be getting on average. 
So now you're $21 million over the salary cap. And you'll have another $10 million or so in rookie contracts that you have to sign next year. So that's about $31 million. And then you have the rookies that you drafted this year that are carrying over that are not accounting for that. You're still in a situation where you're about $40 million over the cap. Best case scenario. Best case scenario. But you have 39 unrestricted free agents. It's not good. You want to hear some of the free agents real quick? Here's some of the free agents they have next year. Unrestricted. Tarverius Ward. Malik Collins. Devondre Campbell. Dre Greenlaw. Jawan Jennings. John Feliciano. Isaac Yidim. Aaron Banks. Ambry Thomas, Diamador Lenore, Talanoa Hafunga, Elijah Mitchell, Jordan Mason. As it stands now, you're set to have free agents, two fifths of your starting offensive line from this year, two thirds of your starting linebackers, two thirds of your running back room, and Four-fifths of your starting secondary are set to be free agents. Unrestricted. So you've got to find a way to clear 40-ish million dollars and sign some big-time players that are going to be free agents. Why is nobody talking about this? Because here's the thing. The 49ers continue to do this thing where they kick the can down the road on these contracts. Let me give you an example. They sign Devondre Campbell to a one-year deal. Did you know that they spread his signing bonus over the course of four years past the one-year deal? That's how they're paying for it. So after he's not on the team, they have four years of paying Devondre Campbell. They're going to pay him for five years to be on the team for one year. Now, it's not a lot of money because you're spreading a, a smaller signing bonus over the course of five years, but he's not the only one. He's not the only one. They're doing that with most of these contracts because they're in a weird situation. So... <laughs> They've done that with Eric Armstead. They've done that with, really, you look at a majority of their contracts, they're doing this where they're kicking the can down the road and, and taking the signing bonus and spreading it over the course of years where players aren't even on the team. And that's what's putting them in this situation. They're going to pay Eric Armstead $15.5 million to not be on the team next year. It's pretty rough. It's pretty rough. <laughs> Let's see. It it is a small number, but Tara, did you hear the rest of what I just said? I'm going to go over it one more time just so everybody understands this, okay? As of right now, the 40 49ers have 6.7 million. I want to make sure to hammer this point home, okay? They have 6.7 million. They're going to free up another 15-ish million post June first with the Eric Armstead contract, but that 15 million goes to next year. Okay. That's going to put them around 21 ish million. Then they're going to free up another 10 million by extending Brandon IU. So that's going to put them in the 31 to $32 million range. Now you have about 10 million that is going to go to your rookies. So that brings you back down to 21, 22 million. The 49ers almost always are going to make an in-season trade or maybe maybe after the draft after june 1st they sign one of these free agent safeties to a, a one-year deal i would imagine the 49ers are going to carry over around 15 million dollars into next year okay as of right now the san francisco 49ers are projected to be 30 million dollars over next year's cap this year's cap is 255 million. Next year's cap projection is 273. Okay. Now this year it went up 30 million. Maybe it goes up 30 million next year. 
Best case scenario, it goes up 30 million. Not likely to happen, but could go up $30 million. So let's put the projected cap at 285. That's going to put them $18 million over the cap next year. However, you're carrying over $15 million because you didn't spend it this year. So a few million dollars you've got to play with, essentially. The problem with that is, is you have all the rookies from this year that are not accounting for next year's salary cap as of yet. The other problem is you've got a big number from Brandon Ayuk that is not on next year's salary cap. And you've got another 10 million or so next year in your rookies that you're going to draft. That means the 49ers are going to be roughly 35 to 40 million over the cap. And that's if the cap goes to 285 million, which would be record breaking back to back years to jump that much. So best case scenario, they're about 35 to 40 million over the cap. They have 39 unrestricted free agents, including four fifths of their projected starting defensive backfield, all three projected starting corners, one of their projected starting safeties. Two thirds of their projected linebacking room. Two fifths of their starting offensive line, projected offensive line, and two thirds of their running back room, all set to be unrestricted free agents next year. I mean, listen, I saw some people say, oh, you're negative. You're being negative. I know some are joking, but some are not. Okay. I mean, I. I'm not trying to be negative. I'm just giving the facts. Those facts seem pretty scary to me. Pretty scary. I mean, that's massive. That's a massive deal. So basically what I'm saying is we're living in the now. We're worried about the team now. Agree with that. The 49ers legitimately, <laughs> they've got to win it this year. This is it for them. This is it. They've got to get it done this year. Now, I, I personally think last year was the year, but truly, if we're, if we're just looking at it, you look at the quality of team, it's going to be harder this year than it was last year, but it doesn't make that impossible. It is going to be harder because teams have gotten better, but this is the year. It's got to happen this year, and if it doesn't, this team is going to be vastly different going into 2025. Vastly different. So... And, and they're not going to be able to make up for that all that talent that is going to leave. They just don't have the money to, to do so. I mean, it can improve in 2026, but then presumably you've got Purdy's big number hitting the cap by then. You've got... Let's see, what else? Maybe Trent Williams retires, but that's a big piece that you got to fill. It just The point is, is it doesn't look like it's going to be necessarily better until maybe 2027, 2028. And that's why, in my opinion, this draft and next year's draft are so important. They've got to hit on some players. And that's why I wouldn't trade second and third round picks to move up in this year's draft or next year's draft because those are your best chances at hitting on a good prospect. They're going to need those players. They're going to need those players. So... Drew W says, as a Rams fan, I love the show. It's real talk. Thank you, Drew. Appreciate you. Did you come over from the Roundtable Sports out of curiosity? MGM says, I don't know if you covered this already, but I heard Danny Gray was also involved in the Rasheed Rice incident. Is this true or did I hear fake news? I don't know that you heard fake news, I, but I don't know that it's true either. What I do know is, his birthday is today. What I do know is he and Rasheed Rice were teammates at SM SMU. And what I do understand is that there were multiple SMU athletes in those vehicles. Now, is one of them gray? I don't know. 
I don't even know if we know that one of them is rice at this point. <laughs> and we've got some blurry pictures where presumably one of them is rice, but we just don't, we don't have enough information yet. We don't, but maybe one of them was, was gray. And if so, that's not great. I mean, he's already going to struggle to make this team. I, I don't know if, if he makes it, if he was on the scene there. MGM Productions follows it up, says, I haven't seen a report on it yet, but they both went to SMU. Yep. And he was there for Rice's birthday party, allegedly. Yeah, I don't know. I think it's, uh wasn't Rice's birthday party. It was Danny Gray's birthday party, presumably. His birthday's today. So unless they both have birthdays over the weekend, I don't know. Dezza says, how much cap space is saved by trading Debo next year? Ooh, not a lot. Not a lot. Let's take a look at it real quick. 49ers salary cap. Let's look at next year. Trade pre-June. About $10 million on Debo. If you trade them post June, you save about seventeen million. So, that's a possibility. Debo could be gone for sure, but you still got to find a lot of way to save. A lot of way to save. <laughs> so, yeah, it's sad, man. It really is sad. That whole situation is is very sad, very very sad. But, you know. That's the thing. It, think about this. I mean, when you were 22, 23 years old, I mean, you thought you were untouchable, I'm sure. We all had that aura of invincibility when we were that age. Even if something happened to a friend, you're like, ah, you know, but not me. Couldn't happen to me. I think everybody went through that at some point. So. I don't know. Third string all pro says, Jesse, honest question. When did you realize you were good at talking to yourself on air? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't know that I, I am good at it. I appreciate that. Really for me, it's just, you can't be, a, you just can't be afraid. If it's something that you want to do, then you've got to be willing to do it. But it definitely is a little weird. I'm not going to lie. Talking to a camera. I know that there's people on the other end of, the, of this whole thing, but you're not there. You're not actually there. We can have kind of a conversation, but not a real, real conversation. So anyways, the salary cap thing is a big deal next year. Big deal. Red Eye says TMZ has proven it is Rasheed Rice in the red do-rag. He was at the party wearing the same sweatshirt as in the crash, same logos. Yeah, I, I, it was presumably him. Here's the other thing, though. Here's the other thing. And I, I don't think they're going to be able to pin this on Rasheed Rice. But the fact that he fled the scene is going to make it really hard to prove that he was the driver. If that is, in fact, him, he was absolutely the driver in. The Lambo, I believe. Because what happens is you see the crash, then you see people hop out of the Lambo, three people. There's two people that hop out of the front, one out of the passenger, one crawls over the driver's seat. Now, you don't see that. You just see a second person come out of the passenger side in the front. Well, that person, I believe, is the same person that was in the red do-rag, which if you're saying that's Rasheed Rice, well, then that process of elimination, he was the driver. But because it all happened so fast and they don't have a clear image, they're not going to be able to pin that on him. So I imagine he gets a plea deal. He'll probably get community service, probably get a six game suspension. Luckily for him, there were no serious injuries, but it was dumb. It was absolutely dumb to say the least. So we'll see. We'll see. 2025. 2025 doomsday salary cap. <laughs> Start giving your suspensions for incidents of this caliber. This happens too often. It definitely does. 
Definitely does. Why is uh, Brock Purdy trending? What's he trending for? What's he trending for? What do you do? What's up, TC? Okay, let's talk about Brandon Ayuk. Now, I don't know what to make of this. There was a smaller account, Matt Miller on Twitter, not ESPN's Matt Miller, but a smaller account, who's done some reporting on some things that have happened in the past, but you never know with these things. Definitely not anybody that's credentialed, not anybody with a blue check mark. So I'm not going to go as too far as to say that, hey, this person is for sure credible. But what I will say is just because it is a small account doesn't mean he's not credible. For those of you that watched my Aaron Donald retirement video, never once have I claimed to have inside information. I'm not an insider. But me, who has a YouTube channel and just enjoys talking San Francisco and really the whole NFL, I get information fed my way sometimes, including the Aaron Donald retirement. I was told that three days before he actually retired. And then I made a video, recorded it on Wednesday, showed proof that it was Wednesday, and then dropped it immediately within a minute or so of him announcing his retirement on Friday. So. If I, me, can get that info, then I'm not going to say that there are other people in a similar situation that have heard things and know things. So I'm not going to write this account off completely. I did DM this gentleman. I asked him how sure he was with what he was reporting. And he said he's 1,000% sure. So I'm going to take him at his word. What he is saying is that. The 49ers are at around 22 million for Brandon Ayuk, and Brandon Ayuk is at 27 and a half million. Now, that is a major gap. Major gap. But the question is this the, I guess the question is less about is he credible or is he right? Now, we did hear reports over the weekend that they are far apart on negotiations. Well, those numbers match that, <laughs> if that is the case. And we did hear that from a credible source. So putting two and two together, chances are that we could be looking at something similar to that. But I have two questions for you. Let's, let's take one half of this at a time. Let's look at the $22 million amount. If the 49ers are offering Brandon Ayuk $22 million, are they lowballing him? Now remember, that's less annual average than what they paid Debo two years ago. I believe he's around $23 million. That would be what in the range of buddy that just got paid from the Tennessee Titans, Ridley, who's not near as good of a receiver. Do you think that that would be lowballing him? I do. I do. I think that that would be lowballing him in a big way. $22 million would be pretty insulting for Brandon Ayuk based off the year he came off of. And really, more importantly, you should be paying players not based off of what they've done, but trying to project what they're going to do. With Debo Samuel, he came off of a record-breaking year. However, the 49ers paid him almost as if he was going to continue to play at a high level or that high of a level. The reality was Debo Samuel was likely never going to have another season quite that good. That was a historic season. So they almost paid him for what he had done, not for what they were projecting him to do. And I would say, happy for Debo that he got paid. But hindsight's twenty twenty. I think it was a bit of an overpay for the production they've gotten from Debo Samuel. So let's look at Brandon Ayuk. If they are paying him for what he's going to do and not what he has done, I would say it's safe to say that Brandon Ayuk, at 26 years old, who is not targeted a ton, is probably going to have the best years of his career in the future. Not what he's already done. I don't believe the best has happened for Brandon Ayuk. I did believe at the time 
And I think most of us probably did if we were looking at, at things objectively, that Debo Samuel had probably what would be the best year of his career in his contract season. Looking at it objectively, it was not going to be easy to duplicate that, which means no matter what he did, he was never going to have a year like he did during that contract year. Brandon Ayuk on the other side of things, I believe this probably wasn't even a top three season for him when he retires. If we get another seven years out of Brandon Ayuk before he retires, I believe that he'll have at least three seasons as good or better than the one that he just had. So to me, $22 million would be, that would be a slap in the face if that is the offer. Okay, let's go to the flip side. Because I, I think both things can be true. I think if the offer is $22 million, that is a big time low ball. But if Brandon Ayuk is at $27.5 million, I think he might be asking for too much. I think he might be asking for too much. Because that would put him in the range of guys that when they got paid money like that were the elite of the elite. Devontae Adams, Tyreek Hill, those types of players. Brandon Ayuk is very good. But I think you can make... I, I make the argument that he's top 10, but he's as close to 10 probably or closer to 10 than he is even five. And I think you could make the argument, I would listen to the argument, and it really comes down to preference, that maybe he's not even top 10, that maybe he's around that 12 range. So if that is the case, I think 27 and a half million, if that's what he's asking for, is also a bit too much. So I think both things can be true. Now, again, we don't know for sure if this report is right. What we do know is ESPN reported that they are far apart in negotiations, which no reason to panic. This is not hit the panic button. And then this gentleman reported the exact numbers, which were 22 million for the 49ers, 27 and a half million for Ayuk. Again, we don't know that that is factual, but I'm not going to poo poo it as if it's not. And that would be, in fact, far apart. That would meet the criteria of far apart, which was reported by ESPN. So that makes it tough. Let's look at what Calvin Ridley got exactly. It's a question in the chat, and I want to know what he got. Calvin Ridley contract. Man, four-year, $92 million, $50 million guaranteed. Let's see what the AAV is. Mm, actually, I like... over the cap a little bit better for this view. Man, his cap number is 10 million this year. Then it goes up to 28, 26.7 and 27.2. So 92 million over the course of four years. Now, again, they have outs. That's not guaranteed, but $92 million cap number over the course of the next four seasons. Damn. That's extremely high. That's extremely high. Let's see what the AAV is for wide receiver right now. The top paid guys. Mm, here we go. We'll go to average per year. Here are the top guys right now. Tyreek Hill at 30 million average. Although a lot of that is because of a dead year, so he's not going to get that, but that's what the numbers say. 30 million for Tyreek Hill, 28 million for Devontae Adams. 26.7 million for Cooper Cup, 25 million for AJ Brown, 24 million for DK Metcalf, 24 million for Stefan Diggs, 
23.85 million for Debo and then 23.3 million for Pittman. Ridley got 23 million. So the 49ers, if they're at 22 million, are offering less than Debo and less than what Ridley just got in this same offseason. That's definitely a low ball, if that is the case. Now, Ayuk asking for $27.5 million. I mean, at this stage, he's better than Cooper Cup. But when Cooper Cup signed that deal, I mean, Cooper Cup was probably higher rated than where Brandon Ayuk is right now, would you say? A.J. Brown at $25 million a year. Again, that was a deal two years ago. If he signed that same deal, let's say he was in the same situation this offseason, top five receiver looking for a deal. I'd say he'd probably be in that 28 range, 29 range. So I, I would say that slightly, Brennan Ayuk is asking for a little bit too much if he's at 27 and a half. I think 26 million is about fair for Brennan Ayuk. That's kind of the number that I've had in my mind for a while. I think 26 million is probably the fair number. That's just me. Smack Jones says they thought they would have one by now. You're talking about rings. Yeah, I would say so. I think the 49ers, I, I mean, really, listen to what George Kittle said at that Super Bowl. What, what he said in 2019, that's a feeling that the 49ers organization had. They felt now probably three or four times that they were the best team in the league and they just haven't won a ring. And on paper, they can make that case. But they haven't won a ring. And and this year is not going to be easier than it was last year. Last year was much easier on paper than what this year is going to be. I mean, we don't even have to talk about teams getting better. Let's just talk about the Super Bowl hangover. That's that's a real thing. When you've had... Somebody can fact check me on this one. But I'm pretty sure the number is, in the last 25 years, the Super Bowl loser has won the Super Bowl the following year one time. And that was a team led by the greatest quarterback of all time in Tom Brady. I mean, it's just not in your favor that that's going to happen. Then when you look at how things went for the 49ers last year, this was the least injured team that the 49ers have had in the last 10 years by a wide margin. A wide margin. Can you expect that that's going to happen again? I would say probably not. I would say probably not. The NFC was about as bad as it could be. Really, it, it wasn't good. The NFC was not good this last year. Now, I don't think that we're going to see major improvements in the NFC. I don't think that all of a sudden it's a juggernaut. But I think it'll be better. I think it'll be better. I think Kansas City will be better. And even if they don't make it out, there's still some really good teams in the AFC. Some really, really good teams. I mean, on paper, let's go player for player. Are they player for player better than the New York Jets even? Now, I, I don't have a lot of confidence in the New York Jets. I don't know what Aaron Rodgers is going to look like. They have a lot of players that could get injured. But I, the reason I throw out the New York Jets is because and the AFC, I mean, that's a team that might not even make the playoffs. That's a stacked roster over in New York. And I think there's a good chance they don't even make the playoffs because the AFC is that good. Burrow will be back healthy. Herbert finally has a head coach. Mahomes is there. Obviously, you know, the Ravens are going to be in the mix. The Steelers improve significantly. The Browns have improved an already stacked roster. There's some good teams in the AFC. Can never count out Josh Allen. He's an elite quarterback. The Texans improved a ton. And you're going into year two with that coaching staff and that quarterback. Like I, I could see a real scenario where the Jets don't even make the playoffs, but if you just go player for player through their roster, man, they're every bit as talented as the 49ers. Every bit as talented. So. I mean, you put the 49ers over in the AFC. I mean, it, it would be struggle, man. It'd be tough. It'd be tough. 
So the point is, is whether they play the Chiefs or anybody in the AFC, whoever comes out of the AFC, that's they're probably not going to be favored. And that's assuming that they make it. So this year is going to be really, really hard, man. It's not going to be easy. Now it's doable. It is doable. The window is not slammed shut. That's not what I'm saying. But really, going over the salary cap like I did, it's pretty clear to see that this is this is it. This is the final year for at least a couple years. Now, if Brock Purdy is elite and he's a franchise quarterback, they'll be down for a year or two. And when I say down, I mean borderline playoff team, probably maybe first round exit type of team for a year or two. And then as long as they draft well, they'll be right back there again, two, three years down the line. So it's not like the sky is falling, but for this team as it's currently constructed, you look at the age of some of the players, you look at the 39 unrestricted free agents next year, you look at even guys that are going to be on this roster, them aging and being expensive, they're going to make a decision like they did with Armstead with at least one guy, I would imagine, next year, whether that's Debo or McCaffrey or Hargrave or Kittle. Some, but they're going to make a tough decision on one of those guys. So, yeah, I mean, this is, this is the final year for this group. This is the final year. So how much does that motivate them? How healthy can they stay? There's a lot of factors that, that go into this, but it's, it's not going to be easy by any means. It is not going to be easy. So. Yeah, you you don't want to chase the ghost of Lombardi. Yeah, it's going to be massive, man. It's going to be massive. Niners, two Super Bowl losses. The defense let up. Niners couldn't stop Mahomes after a third and 15 and Super Bowl loss in 2019. Defense gave up again in overtime, allowing 75. Okay. I disagree with this. I disagree with this. In what world, for this Super Bowl at least, in what world do you think that you should expect any defense in the league to stop the Chiefs from scoring a touchdown when they get four downs to get their first down? If you're giving Patrick Mahomes four downs to get a first down, I mean, that's a cheat code. It's a cheat code. And he knew he had four downs. They were going for a touchdown no matter what, which means no matter what, they were going for it on fourth downs. That's, I mean, that's just not, uh, it's just not realistic, man. It's not real. They went a whole third quarter without moving the ball after the defense put them in a really good position, a really good position. The defense put them in a really good position with a turnover to start the third quarter. And they couldn't get any points out of that situation? None? If the offense had just gotten three points, they they possibly won that game. They possibly won that game. They probably win that game. So, I, listen, I, I think, I really think it was a full team effort. But if I had to blame a unit first of all it'd be special teams <laughs> it'd be special teams they essentially gave up seven and then moody had a kick blocked that's an eight point turnaround so if i had to blame a unit it would be the special teams but then i would blame the offense i would blame the offense after that and then the defense the defense was the least of my concerns in that super bowl that's me personally they should have scored more points. You can't be that team, the 49ers offense, with that many superstars and presumably an elite quarterback. I mean, let's break it down. You have an elite play caller. These are, these are the things that I heard all year, right? Elite play caller. The best running back in the game. Arguably the best pass catching core in the whole NFL when you look at Kittle, Ayuk, Debo, Jennings, CMC is a part of that, Use check would be a part of that. I mean, I I would put that reception core up against anybody in the league. So, one of the if not the best pass catching groups in the NFL, the best running back in the NFL. 
one of the best play callers in the NFL, the best left tackle in the NFL, and an elite quarterback. And you put up 19 points? 19? And that's with minimum three gift wrapped to you on a silver platter to start the second half, and you get zero points in that scenario? In must, must score situations, the final three drives, they put up six points. When all of those drives really were kind of must score situations, they put up six points. I mean, okay. And, th and then when you put up your final three, you said, oh, here, Patrick, you get four downs to get first downs now. I mean, what did you expect was going to happen? Definitely blame the offense over the defense. Now, really, I would blame the special teams. But again, if I'm blaming offense or defense, 100% the offense. And the defense lost Dre Greenlaw. What's the equivalent player to Dre Greenlaw on the offense? Brandon Ayuk? I mean, let's, let's look at the best players on the defense. You have Bosa. He's not better than Bosa. You have Fred Warner. He's not better than Fred Warner. He's arguably what third at worst case scenario, the fourth best player on that defense. Let's say, let's say worst case scenario, Dre Greenlaw is the fourth best player on that defense. They lost him for a whole half. Who's the fourth best player on the offense? Brandon Ayuk. Brandon Ayuk. So they lost Brandon Ayuk essentially for a whole half on defense, still held to 19 points in regulation. I mean, what more do you want from him? And created a turnover on the first drive. Putting the offense in a very, very advantageous spot. Defense did what they were supposed to do. Daza says, even if the stars align and Brock Purdy gets better, which I think he will, do we really believe Kyle Shanahan can, Shanahan can win us a Super Bowl? He's too conservative at times, like in the Super Bowl, kicking a field goal in overtime. I don't know, man. It's tough. Like, he hasn't done it yet. He has made some major blunders in some key situations, blown some sizable leads. I'm not going to say he can't do it, but you're, to your point, do you believe he will do it? No, I, I think, it, what's the evidence? At this point, it would be blind belief. But I'm not going to say he can't do it. Cryptic says, what's our identity? Is it still the defense running offense? Purdy broke the all-time passing record. Would you bank on him getting over 4K again or CMC being the number one running back? Mm, I think Purdy will get over 4 4K is such a light number in a 17-game season. I mean, that's not... What are we talking about? Let's, let's math it out real quick. If you play 17 games... Get my trusty calculator. 4,000 yards divided by 17. That's 235 yards passing a game. Yeah, he better get over 4,000. <laughs> so I would bank on that. Uh, I don't... I mean, I don't know who's going to pass CMC, but I don't know that I would... If I had to choose one of those to not be true, I would say CMC wouldn't be the number one running back again. Just because... I think injury, you, you can never account for injury. Plus, he'll be like 20, what, 28-ish? 27, 28? I mean, that's getting up there for a running back coming off as many touches as he had. So I would say I wouldn't bank on him being the number one running back. I think he can be, but it's going to be... That would be the lesser of two chances, I would say, would be, be him. I think Brock Purdy getting over 4,000 should be a lock. Unless he just misses a ton of time. But 235 yards a game is pretty anemic. You got to remember, that that, 40, that was a record for the 49ers, but that record gets smashed every year by other quarterbacks and has been for a long time. Every year, by multiple quarterbacks, they run through that record. So 4,000 yards is not a big number to NFL standards by any means in a 17-game season. It's not. Yeah, I mean, 4,000 is pretty, pretty easy. 
Pretty easy. No. I'm an Oregon Duck fan, and I say absolutely not. <laughs> I say absolutely not. Absolutely not. No. No, no, no. So, all right, y'all. I went an hour. Went an hour with the help of you guys in the chat. Appreciate you. Hopefully, I was able to hammer home that middle section, which was the salary cap hell that the 49ers are facing in 2025 and why that's important, why we've really got to pay attention to that. It's not being talked about enough. Understandably so, because we're in 2014 and we're worried about this year. But next year, it's it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough. So, I don't know. Um. Yeah, but they also rush for a thousand yards or eight hundred yards or whatever. You know what I mean? Like total yards all in, these guys get forty five hundred every year. So it's just the way that it is, man. When you run as often as them, you're going to get there. You're going to get there. I mean, it is in today's NFL. I mean, it's pretty pretty big. I don't know. Four thousand is pretty easy to get. Cousins does it every single year. Yeah, he does. So, anyways, if if unless now if Purdy's in a run for five hundred yards and wants to throw for thirty eight hundred, I'm fine with that. If that's going to be a part of his game, I'd be totally cool with that. But I I just think that he's if you're a pure pocket passer, which he is mostly a pure pocket passer, four thousand has to happen every year. It has to. It absolutely has to happen. So, I don't know. Anyways, all right, y'all. Stay blessed. I'll be back tomorrow night with Sunil. And until then, peace.